And uh, we just love the Christmas season. We love the opportunity to uh, focus in on the birth of Jesus Christ, um, the person of Christ. It's, it's, it, the, the birth is obviously an amazing and great story. And uh, we had a nativity play here the other week with the kids. It was just fantastic. Angels and shepherds and all kinds of exciting things going on. Um, and the story is just wonderful, and it, it just really warms the heart, all the different things. And there's a villain, a Darth Vader, right there in the middle called Herod. So lots of exciting stuff going on. But at the core of it, the Christmas story is about the person who was born, who was Jesus Christ. And uh, so there's a reason why um, I know many people celebrate Christmas for so many reasons, because the festivities, the turkey, the gifts, so on and so forth, the holiday parties. Uh, but for those of us who are in Christ... At the core of it, it's the celebration of the coming of Jesus and giving thanks for that. And uh, so we're so pumped about that. We love that. And it makes that. I'm so thankful you're here with us today, right? Because you could be doing last minute shopping right now, but you're not. You're here because you want to keep Christ at the center uh, of what's going on over the Christmas season. So God bless you for that. And with the coming of this child, Jesus, who grew up to be a man, uh, there were so many promises associated with him. They prophesied about Jesus, th uh, not thousands, sorry, hundreds of years before he arrived. The prophets, by the power of the Spirit of God, began to proclaim and declare that a child was going to come, a, a, a man was going to come, and there were many promises associated with him of the things that he was going to do and the difference that he was going to make in the world. And we've looked at some of those. There was a promise that he would bring light to people in darkness. There was a promise that he would, bring, uh, he would be a king who would set people free and help break chains of bondage in people's lives and in, and in the world. There were, there, were, there were so many. There was a promise that he would bring peace. And we looked at that, how he, he was proclaimed that he would bring peace to people's hearts. And even more incredibly, ultimately, he's even going to bring peace to the world that struggles to find peace in this generation. So we want to look at the last one today. There are many more. We could go on for, literally, we could go on the whole year, every Sunday, because of the many promises that were placed upon this child's coming. But the one that we want to look today is, is probably the most profound of all the promises. And that's why we're going to look at it. The promise that this child was God with us. The promise that this child was going to be God with us with us. In a very real, manifest, and literal sense, this child, inherent in his coming, was a promise um, that the child was going to be God with us. Now, uh, my cousins are visiting, so um, they wanted to see a professional game of sports, so we sent them off to the hockey game last night. But we didn't have tickets for them, so we went where everybody else goes. We went to Craigslist. I'm told you never meant to do that, but we went to Craigslist um, to try and find tickets. And everybody's selling their season tickets on their and so we looked over it and tried to check it out. And uh, what's interesting is that, obviously, if you want to get the tickets close to the ice, right, right on the ice where the action is, where the guy goes bang in the glass in front of your face, you know, you're paying two, three hundred dollars or two hundred dollars at least to get a ticket there. That wasn't a very popular game, but that's kind of what you're paying for that. Um, and, uh, but I thought about that, and then, and then I thought about that, and then the other seats were, you know, like 50 bucks way up in the rafters, right, where the angels are, sitting with the angels. And so uh, j just, just looking at the two different levels of, of tickets available there. And for two reasons, I chose the ones with the angels. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Price had nothing to do with it at all. Nothing. Zero. Zilt. I would do anything for my cousins, right? My, my, my nephews and nieces, no. Um, uh, the, the, we ended up with the upper, but we thought about it and talked about it a lot. And, and one of the things I said, you've, they'd never seen hockey before. I'd never seen a hockey game before. And so I said, you know, the, one of the problems with being on the ice, if you don't know the game, you may not quite get it, right? But if you're up with the angels, this is our vote, right? you're up with the angels, you will be looking down and you will see the big picture yeah, uh huh? See, yeah, yeah. Right there. Right there. Right there. You will see the big picture. You will, you will uh, understand what the whole game actually is. You'll understand what the end of what, the, what, the, what they're trying to actually do. And then when you come next time, we'll buy you the tickets right down on the ground. Okay. So when we look at the story of Jesus, the birth of the baby is is right. You're in the front row. It's, 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 it's one of the front row seats of, this, of God's plan, actually watching the birth of the child and the proclamations that were associated and all the things that happened. 
But what I want to do a little bit today is, is kind of step back and look at the game plan that God's got going on here. Why, why is the child born? Why, why has the child come? How does this fit into what God is trying to do in his overall plan? Step back and go up with the angels, huh? huh? All right, like that? Go with the angels and watch and see what is going on. What's God's plan? And when it comes down to the end game of God, this book, the end game of this book, this book does not record everything about God. God can't fit into a book. He's infinite, right? But it fits. It has everything we need to know because this book was written for us, that we would know everything we need to know about God. And this book reveals the end game of what God's trying to do. The birth of this child was part of the end game of what God was trying to accomplish in this world and what God's trying to accomplish in your life. This is both universal and personal. What's the end game God is trying to do? The ultimate end game, the ultimate goal of the nativity story was for God to provide a way, to accomplish a way that he could permanently be with you. That's the end game. This is what this book is about. This book, from the beginning, it starts the same as it ends. We're going to get into that. This book... It's about how God is working. I love that song Luke's been singing recently. Has been relentlessly seeking to find a way to be with you. The scripture uses all kinds of words for it. To abide with you is what Jesus would use. The Old Testament would call dwell with you. Sometimes they said walk with you. All different, same concept. The idea of permanent association. Permanent presence. Permanent being. Not God at a distance, not God as a vague concept, but personal, here, real, now, walking, living, talking, breathing together. That's God's ultimate plan. And Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 puts it this way. He calls it the relentless desire of God. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. That's amazing. God's will. That he's trying to accomplish. This is what pleases him. This is his pleasure. This is his purpose in the face of the earth. Which he purposed in Christ. The coming of this child was core to this. The will of God being accomplished. The mystery of God being accomplished. And he put it into effect when times reached their fulfillment. To bring unity in all things. He wants to bring it all together. Accomplish his plan on heaven and earth. I love the way that scripture talks about mystery. Because honestly it is a mystery. As to why this whole book. And the eternal spirit of all things, God, would spend so much effort trying to be with you and trying to be with me. Um, If you're a parent or a friend of a friend, and you see a young woman or a young man uh, start to take an interest in somebody, uh, a romantic interest in somebody, You know, as a parent, sometimes you would definitely ask this question. As a friend, you might ask this question. It's a mystery to me. I have no idea what they see in that person. (laughs) Right? Sometimes you may even say, I actually don't like that person. And my friend or my relative is interested. It's a mystery. I don't see what they see. You know, sometimes you see a a really good-looking woman with a really not-so-good-looking man, right? And you say, I don't, and, and you say, I don't see what I see there. I, I, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any success. He doesn't have, you know, I'm thinking natural terms. I would never think in these terms. I'm just thinking like you think, not how I think. <laughs> um, uh, see, I'm just, just helping you out there. I just want to bring it to your level, right? Just bring it to you. I'd never think that. Never think that, right? But, but why is, <laughs> why? Uh, it's a mystery. It's a mystery to me. Why you are like that? That's what Paul talks about here. He calls it a mystery. Why the God of the universe would pursue me. Why this whole book from beginning, the game plan of even this birth of the child is about God being with us. God dwelling with us. God, Because I look at myself sometimes and I don't even want to be with me. Right? And if I knew all about you, I probably wouldn't want to be with you either. Come on, let's be honest about it, Right? But the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the maker of all things, he is relentless in seeking through this game plan to work it out that he can be with us. Now, there's a barrier that stops him. That's why it's so complicated. But he is working everything he can 
And that's what the birth of this child is about. Emmanuel, God with us. God coming to dwell with us. It's part of this, it's, 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 the, it's, the kicker, it's the kicker shot. It's the trick play. Nobody saw it coming. Not even the devil himself. Bang! Got it in the net. This idea of God working towards his plan. And it's not just universal. It's for you. This book was written for you. Yes, it was written for all of humanity. But I'm telling you the truth. If you were the only person alive, God would have done the same because his love for you is relentless. He is working. He would still give up his son to die for you that you could be reconciled with God. That's the amazing thing about this story. So I'm going to take a few moments this morning just to go back into the angel seats, the cloud. That's a great new name. Let's not call them nosebleeds anymore. Let's call them the angel seats. They'll be able to, if you have seats laying there, you'll be able to sell them for twice as much. Okay, so let's just go back a little bit and have a look at some of what the scripture, how this, the game plan plays out. Right from the very beginning, in creation, everything God does, Everything he does in the Bible, this motive is what drives him, the desire to, to be with us. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. Why? He wants that. Why? He loves us so. It is a mystery. But everything in this book is driving towards that purpose. It is the end game. It is the goal that he's seeking to accomplish. In creation, Genesis chapter 2, and then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the call of the day. That's really key right there. In the very beginning, the, the Garden of Eden is a picture of the way that God wanted things to be. And what happens in the call of the, call of the evening, God would come and he would walk. Now, we don't know how that manifests. We don't know how that looks. We don't know what that actually meant. But the primary concept here is fellowship. So God, God created us from the very beginning to walk with God. Oh, my goodness me, right? And, 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 and uh, you know, I, uh, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I get older in marriage, uh, a lot of things are happening. My wife is obviously, she's way wiser than I first thought. Actually, I found out that she's extremely wise and I'm not wise at all. Lots of amazing <laughs> things are happening, right? But have you found a marriage, if you have a good marriage, that when the person's away, you or your children are away, a great time, at, there's a longing. God, God doesn't want that kind of separation. He loved to be with these, his created beings. Humanity. We were created to communicate with God, talk with God. God would come in the call of the evening, on a, on, on a daily basis it seems, and meet with humanity and talk. And, I just can't, can you get your head around that? The God of the universe just wanting to fellowship all the time with us and talk with us. But the problem was, on that particular day, they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to man, where are you? Huh? That's the voice of God speaking to us all the time. Where are you? Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. This is man speaking, Adam. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I heard. Basically what had happened is that Adam and Eve had... A sin. And what the sin was is that they wanted to do things their own way. And they, want, they disobey what God instructed them. And this is this bang, we have the problem. This is where the problem happens. If you've not heard the story before, this is the nativity story. What happened way back then that has stayed, plagued humanity forever is that we, 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 just, we, just, we just went our own way. We want to do things our own way. And we don't, we don't want to walk with God. We want them when we have problems, help! But the rest of the time, we want to do things our own way. And this is what took place. And so God, God could not walk with them anymore because this issue of, of, of their rebellion and their independence and their self-will and, and out of this thing came, oh, all kinds of ugliness. Out of this, out of this, out of this came lying and, and cheating and, and murder and hatred and humanity. Just, we, just, we just became this horrible goo of potentially good, but also potentially incredibly wicked. 
And God, this is where it came. And so, so, so from the very beginning, God's desire was to be with us. But then the problem came along. And now God has to... And, and this is the thing about God. Do you get this? He did not throw us away. Somebody say amen to that. I mean, honestly, if I was God, and I, that, that's a stupid statement to even make. But, um, you know, if we human beings were God, we would, we would discard it. This is, you, 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 there's no reason why he just, bang. But God's love for us is so great, he did not discard us. But he said, I will work and work and work. And this is true of your life personally. I want you to get this. This is a big picture story, but this is a personal story. If you have mucked it up, if you have got things you've done that you're shameful about, whatever, and you feel far from God, this story tells us the nature of God. He, um, he could have just removed it, but right away in that scripture, he makes a promise and he says, I'm going to bring one who is going to help rectify this circumstance. And that's what God's done in your life. He, he hasn't abandoned you. You may not be walking with him, but God is relentlessly seeking to find a way that you would hear him again, you would turn to him, and you would receive his grace in your life. From there, God went the route of Israel. I want to look at Israel about dwelling with God. In Exodus chapter 29, verse 44, So I will consecrate the temple meeting and an altar, and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. And here's the key verse. I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt, so I will dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So what God did, and again, it's all part of his strategy, long-term strategy, long-term vision, is he raised up a, a gentleman called Abraham who was just an amazing guy who loved God and was very faithful. And Because of his faithfulness, God could build the nation on that foundation. And they went along, and the nation grew in number. And then eventually God called them out of Egypt. Do you remember these stories? And he put them into the desert for one purpose alone. He wanted to make sure that he was at the center of all they were going to do. And so God told them to make a, an ark, which is a box. And, uh, and uh, he said, I am going to get the key word here, dwell with my people. Okay, so the, the nation of Israel, before they went into their native land, there was you know, hundreds of thousands of people, but at the center of their camp, they had a, a, a box. Now, it was a very beautiful box, and in that box, God said, my presence. Basically, he was saying, my presence will be, my, my presence will be in the center of all that you do. So you see what God's plan is here again. He wanted to dwell with Adam and Eve. That they broke, they didn't, couldn't do it. So now he says, I'm going to try, I'm, I'm doing another strategy. I'm going to dwell physically in the midst of the nation. And the whole system of priests, I want you to understand that. You know, they had to do all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was going to worship. If we were going to worship this morning. It would be a lot different to this. We'd all have to bring a goat. Uh, our lobby would be very different. That's where they sacrificed the goats. And then we'd all be in here. So it was a very different kind of experience. Why did they do all that kind of stuff? They did all that kind of stuff because to be in the presence of God required your sin to be taken away and it needed to be overlooked so the animal had to die a death in place of the mistakes you had made so that you could walk with God so God set up this elaborate system very elaborate system so that people could walk with God why because his game plan is again he wants to be with you and so the Israelites followed this system and sometimes it worked really well but for the most part Again, they didn't do very good at it. They got distracted. Their own interests were first. They often neglected it. They often pursued other things. This is our story. And as a result, God's, God, God said, this is, this is not going, I'm showing you, I want to dwell with you, but you can't do it on yourself. So next, he uses the prophets. And Isaiah begins to prophesy, and many of the prophets begin to prophesy that God has tried to walk with us. God has tried to set up a system, a religious system, that would enable us to do it. That didn't work. We can't stick to it. So now God is going to take it. He's going to play the game himself. He's going to bring it about by himself. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, 
and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. And when you look at all the prophets in the scriptures, there's many who proclaim this child's coming. He's saying this is going to be something very significant. Going on to the next one, incarnation. So they're waiting. They wait for about 400, 600 years for these prophecies to come true. God wants to be with us. There's people here longing to be with God. Sin is separating. They are trying to do the old system, but it's not working very well. So if I'm talking about a hockey game, we're down 2-0, maybe 3-0. Okay, we're not doing well. And God is not able to unite with us. So then we have the nativity. This is the crux of it. All these things that have been prophesied and all of God's desire is, is manifested in the birth of this child. John tells us the word became flesh and made us dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one of the only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. I, I, um, Matthew writes, uh, this child that is born is Emmanuel, God with us. We read in Mary's story, the angel said to Mary, this is God's son. You will be conceived of the Holy Spirit. God's son will, be, will come and dwell amongst people. I love this scripture. I chose this scripture here because the thing I like about the disciples is that they are writing this after they have lived with Jesus and Jesus has died and, 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 and risen again and gone to glory. So they've had a chance to watch the whole story, be there for the whole story, and process it. Right? And at the end of it, they are absolutely convinced this one they have seen is the Son of God. You know, there are... There are sports players, athletes, a lot of athletic, last week it was families, this week it's athletes. There are a lot of different levels of athletes, you know, um, there's very just recreational. Uh, 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 Mike and I used to play soccer for a church team and we were always benched, so we were low-level, <laughs> low-level recreational soccer players, okay? And then there are other, you know, there, there's semi-pro professionals and then there's professionals, you know, hockey players, football players, whatever. But then you get to the super elite, which are known by name, right? Michael Jordan, yeah? Uh, Usain Bolt, right? Um, Serena and, and, and um, Williams and, and, and her sister. And, uh, you know, uh, Tom Brady, right? I'll just give you an action for everyone I do, so you know what I'm doing. Here. Um, the big guy used to hit all the time. What was it? A papa. Um, yeah, yeah, or Babe Ruth, whatever you want, right? Okay, so these are, these are at another Tiger Woods. They're at another, Tiger Woods, sorry, just, Tiger Woods. They're all at another level again. When the disciples watched Jesus and they got to the end of his life and they thought back about what they had seen, this is what they declare. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. What they are saying is he was out of this world. He was beyond what anybody else was like. We saw it. We watched him. We witnessed the way he spoke. We witnessed the way he healed people. We witnessed his death upon the cross. We witnessed his resurrection. And you can forget about Tiger Woods, and you can forget about Tom Brady, and you can forget about Serena, you can forget about all these people, because he was just way above all of them. He was divine. He was the Son of God. Amen, yeah. That's, 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 that's what they're saying. And so the incarnation, when we look at this child... That's why Matthew says in his gospel, when he talks about the baby, he says this baby is Emmanuel. This baby is God with us. This baby is as there was an ark in the Old Testament, the divine spirit. This baby is the divine spirit of God. The spirit of God is in this child, on this child, is this child. And this child has come and God is now dwelling with us. And the other disciple says, we watched him, we walked with him, we talked with him, we saw what he did, and we attest he was just above anything else that could possibly be. Surely he was the son of God. See, so the incarnation is this 
Every time they told somebody about this, they got so excited because, because this is God's game plan. This is the key play God is going to make. This is, this is just going to change everything. It's, it's loaded bases, and he's about to hit the home run. This is Jesus coming, the God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God to bring about this accomplishment has been joined together. So then we have the gospel itself. The incarnation is God dwelling with us and Christ growing up. And the disciples saying it was God in the flesh. We beheld his glory. We saw he truly was. Everything he did was, 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 was of God. He was God. And then the gospel message. The gospel message is the message that this one who was without sin died for us. And this is, this is it. This is it. This is when it all happens. The birth is the beginning of the play that changes everything. And the death is the play that changes everything. And look what they say in the scriptures about it. Those who passed by Jesus when he was on the cross hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Who are you? Uh, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Because they had remembered Jesus say that... Um, I will pull down the temple and, on, and in three days, and then I will rebuild it again. Everybody underst didn't understand what he's made, but you've got to get what Jesus is saying. Because remember, that's why we went back earlier. You remember we talked about the tabernacle. Remember we talked about the ark and the box with the glory of God in it. Eventually, they moved it out of a tent, and they put it into a temple. And what Jesus Christ is saying, that is God dwelling with us. His presence is there. But I have come to the earth, and I am now Emmanuel, God with you. And what I am going to do, this is the game plan of God. This is the end game. This is where we get the winning strike. This is when God gets what he wants. He, I have come, and when you kill me, my body, because I am the Son of God, what you don't realize is that it's going to destroy the old system, and now the ability of people to reach God no longer has to go through a system, has to go through a person, has to go through a priest, because when you kill me, I will rise again, and now the power of God, and the glory of God, and the grace of God, and the forgiveness of God is accessible to everybody, and now you can have God dwell with you. That's the, that, that's the gospel message. That's the, that's the Christmas story right there, right? It's God dwelling with us through Jesus Christ. This was just the beginning, the baby. But it's a, you've got to pull back. You've got to go to the angel seats and see the gate. That's why the angels were pumped, right? The shepherds could only see a baby in squaddling clothes, but the angels saw the game plan. They, this is it. You don't know. This is the beginning of the play of plays. This is where God gets what he wants universally, but for you personally. This child, it seems like a great cute story, and it is. But this child is Emmanuel, God with us. And his death is the biggest thing ever in the history of time. Where God breaks down the old system, breaks down the barriers. Because he longs for you and he longs for me. And he would give up his own son for the purpose of reuniting us with him. Because of the gospel message. Because of the message of the cross. Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Get that? Enter the most holy place. Because of what Jesus has done for us. We can now enter into and dwell with and walk with and have God in our lives continuously. Working with us by the new and living way he's opened to us through the curtain that is his body. His body broke it. God is in it. The promise. Jesus resurrected and went to heaven, but he didn't leave it there. John 14 verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and there's many scriptures like this, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, and he lives with you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Do you see that? The spirit of the truth. The world doesn't know him. They can't see him. But you know him. Get this. One, two, three. For he lives with you, and he will be in you. Oh, holy moroli. Okay? 
We start in the garden and God's walking with them. We go and the God is in the box and we go and, and the God is with his son and his son. And now because of the resurrection, those who believe in Christ, they now have Emmanuel inside them. The spirit of the living God dwelling with them. Oh yeah, it's pretty amazing. This is the Christmas story. See, when you hear the Christmas story, many of you, some of you have only ever heard this little bit of it. But oh, it's the beginning of something awesome. The advocate. I love the advocate. The Holy Spirit. How many of you can remember what it was like before we had cell phones? Can anybody remember that? Do you think you could survive without them? I don't know. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a neurotic parent like many of you. I want my kids to text me and call me all the time. And, uh, you know, they, they, they do. And, um, you know, the Holy Spirit has been given to us for this very purpose, that we would be able to talk with God, walk with God. I love the person of the Holy Spirit. At Christmas, I am thankful that the presence of God is in my life, guiding me, speaking to me, talking to me. Is there anybody else who can say amen to that? God with us. Like, a, like, like there, constantly, like a cell phone, man. Don't spend a thousand bucks on a cell phone. Find Jesus. It's find the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because he's with you. That's what God desired from the beginning, to walk with us. And this is his game plan. And we begin to experience it even now. It's not necessarily automatic and easy when you become a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that straight away, every day, you're going, whoa, whoa. It's not like that. But it's a stirring in the heart. It's a hearing. It's a change. It's a transformation that God does. Lastly, eternity. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband, and a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place. Get that? God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for old things have passed away. This is God's ultimate plan, is that when people pass from this earth, like our sister did this week, when people pass from this earth, they go to dwell with God forever. There is no separation. There is no barrier. No more tears, no more crying, no more pain. I think heaven's going to be unbelievable. It really is. Uh, how much time have I got? Okay. I was listening to a radio broadcast from the BBC, CBC, because I enjoy the little documentaries they do, whether I agree with them or not, I enjoy them. But, um, so there's one guy in there, he was talking about the Adam and Eve stories. He's a professor from Harvard. He's not a believer, but he was talking about the story. He'd done a whole book on the Adam and Eve story and, and its, its, its place in history. And at the very end of the story, his talk, he was talking about how the Garden of Eden represents paradise. And he said he went to um, Uganda, and he went to a little island in Uganda, I've been there, where it's a chimpanzee refuge. And he's a secular, he's like evolution and all that. So he watched the chimpanzees and he said, oh, it was just like paradise. No shame, no guilt. People, chimpanzees just ran around happy as could be. I thought, that's so weird. And, um, and, then he, <laughs> and, then he, and then But then at the end, he, he said something that really struck me. He's very honest. He said, except for the fact that the chimpanzees are quite violent, and they beat up on each other, and they kill somebody if they don't like them. And I thought, yeah, that's paradise, right? Right there, okay? Chimpanzees killing each other. I'm, I'm into it. That's not heaven. See, when we get to heaven, God has removed our sin. The plan had to be very strategic because the problem was sin is within us. So he's got to get sin out of us without destroying us. The only one who could do that was his son, Jesus Christ. You know, some people say, oh, I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go down and be and hang out in hell. You do not want to do that. You do not want to do that. And the reason why you don't want to be in heaven is because you've not had the transformational experience of meeting God. When you meet God, you don't want to be anywhere else. You want to be where God created you to be, which is with the Lord. 
And so this scripture tells us that this, this game plan of God, you get it? The game plan of God from the beginning to the end, where the nativity fits in, it's the strategic moment when God brings Jesus on the ice. Right then. And But the game plan is that we would be with God, God with us, and we with God. Let's stand to our feet. You know, um, I got a thought. I know you get a little scared when you when I say that thought. No, I think let's do. What about Oh Holy Night again? Yeah, yeah. We love you. Luke wrote a song. Okay, you do your song, Luke. Do your song. Okay, Mike voted for the song. Okay. We're a, we're a democracy, apparently, in this church. Okay. Can, can, you, can you pull it up, Jane? You got the slides from the production? Is that, does that work? I just, you you have we'll give Jane that's a second. A big, awesome. That's a big key. Yeah. All right. So, um, so, yeah, tonight we're going to do it again, and I've got, we've got a seven-piece string section. It's amazing. So if you haven't come, come check it out because it's just so beautiful. The Del Rosarios are amazing, as you well know, but we'll, just, we'll give you a little bit of a, a torn down. Should they be city or, or sandy? Uh, or sandy? Seat, and then they can stand up later once they you get guys, the hand. It, yeah, have a seat, have a seat. Okay, have, have a seat. seat. Yeah, have yeah, seat. yeah, 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 yeah. We are so organized. It's been a long week, right? So we're just going to like get in there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we want to thank you today for, Lord, just the tremendous nativity story. Uh, we understand it's a beautiful story, but it's only part of the bigger story which is the story of your relentless pursuit of us, Jesus. Lord God, you love us, and it's a mystery. It is a mystery why you do, but you do. And from, from time beginning, even when we rejected you and we, we did some, whether it was Adam and Eve or whether it's us in our own lives, have done some stuff that just reveals the the, the, the depth of our hearts. You still pursue us. You haven't abandoned us. For people here today, Lord Jesus, that don't know you, maybe that's you today. You don't know Jesus Christ. Just why everybody's heads, are, um, eyes are closed, just to give people privacy. Maybe this message is the first time you've heard this message. This message of uh, God is pursuing you. God wants to dwell in you. God wants to walk with you. God wants to be in your life. He's been chasing you from time began. Even before you were born, He's been chasing you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. While every eye is closed, if that's you this morning, say, yes, I, need the, I, 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 I want to walk with God. I'm not walking with God, but I want to walk with God. I want God in my life. You just lift your hand up. No one's looking. It's just you and the Lord. It's not even me. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you thanks, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
A Savior has come A Savior has come And how can it be This baby would save me How can it be that this child would save the world How can it be This baby would save me How can it be That this child would save the world How can it be This baby would save me how can it be that this child saved the world? You came to earth in the most humble form and grew to a king with a crown made of thorns when you died for us, made us whole. Lord, when you died for us to save our souls, well, then you rose again, made us whole. Lord, you rose again, save our souls. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your perfect plan. Thank you for your presence in this place today. You tore the veil. You've made a way. Thank you, Jesus. Let your presence be upon your people over this season. Let them be filled with your, your grace and your life. Let their mouths be filled with praise and thanksgiving for the things you've done. Let us, as we come into the new year, continue to let the gospel transform us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a very Merry Christmas.